A good afternoon, everybody. It is Thursday, August 25th at a little bit past noon, our new start time for our Thursday meetings, which cover macro and ETF investing. Today, I did a presentation already for The Money Show, and I'm going to do that presentation for you with a couple of additions. So just to review the four-step investment process, we want to find the strongest secular trends. We want to see what central banks and the government are doing to change timelines or pick winners. We want to dig into industry and company fundamentals, as well as at the end of the process, apply technical and quantitative price analysis to try to get the best exits and entries. I'm a position trader, so I'm typically trying to find trades that last at least a few quarters if not several years. And several years is the preference because that's generally where you get the biggest winners. So I've been saying fourth industrial revolution and clean energy. You could also call it technological advancement and sustainability. Either way, those are the two strongest trends on the secular economy uh, next to demographics. So technology at the core of sustainability. If you do a search on decarbonization, digitization, and decentralization, you will find all kinds of reports from the likes of Ernst Young and other uh, accounting firms and research firms. Clean energy's future is now, not tomorrow. It was tomorrow, yesterday. Today is now. Technology, industry, utilities, and the government are driving this. So what do we know so far? Well, clean energy is outgrowing fossil fuels by four to one right now. So there isn't much growth in fossil fuels at all in reality. Uh, because they are simply replacing and, and cannibalizing a lot of the sales. However, in order to continue to get as much oil and gas, and at this point we're having an uptick in coal, uh, they have to spend some money and create some growth. That's going to end up being an inverse number soon as the demand for fossil fuels starts to fall towards the end of this decade. It'll start with coal, be followed by oil, and then natural gas probably. 2040-ish in that area. So pretty long runway for natural gas, not much for coal and oil. We can tell already that's the end of the oil age uh, based on what's coming in EVs and what we see the capital budgets being five plus years out. So there is also fossil fuel divestment among investors, particularly institutional investors. And that is going to make it difficult for many of the fossil fuel stocks to get any investment money, which means that unless they're buying back a ton of shares, you cannot be in fossil fuel stocks that aren't either somehow high growth, and there's only a handful, or buying back a ton of shares. And there's a handful of those too. Most of them are in conventional resources, not fracking. Most of the frackers, you can do a simple calculation on the math. Can they buy back all their shares basically is what you're looking for over the next five to 10 years. If they can't, you're going to have a problem. Uh, what we do know, and it was in Bloomberg today, is that the frackers, if oil prices stay up here around 80 or 90 or 100, will be pretty much out of debt by 2024 or 2025. So if they're out of debt in 2025, but demand for what they're doing goes down, you have to resize the company based on what they actually think the revenues will be down the road, especially if the price of oil falls, which is likely. So where is that money going? It's going into clean energy and other decarbonization solutions. Uh, some examples, investment in battery energy storage is up to 20 billion this year. Uh, clean energy investment is growing by 12% year over year and it is actually accelerating, uh, especially with these tax breaks. California already has 60% of the state's electricity from renewable and zero carbon sources. So that should tell you that it can be accomplished. Uh, FERC, based on new rules, and upgrading of the grid projects that 80% of U.S. electricity uh, could be fulfilled by alternative energy by around 2030, probably just a little bit later. These uh, charts are a little stretched from the EIA, but you can see that renewable energy is growing the fastest. Natural gas is keeping up right now as it replaces some of the coal, but eventually natural gas will follow the same curve as coal, but probably not for 15, 20 years. Where are the utilities investing? They control the energy system. Where are they investing? 40% solar, 30% wind. This number is going up. This number is staying about the same. 
natural gas is also flat, batteries are, is, is increasing, nuclear is staying the same. So what you're going to see is certain things grow as we use more electricity, mainly for the EVs. This is where it's going to grow in the solar for the most part, and everything else probably stays pretty similar for distribution, at least until the natural gas starts to fall. I will say to you this, I just talked to some of the biggest real estate investors in Milwaukee. What we discussed is that in a brand new subdivision or a brand new development, not connecting natural gas and using that money instead to build a microgrid with the current tax breaks that just got passed becomes very viable. So you're going to start to see under the current uh, tax regime with the current incentives just got passed, uh, you're going to see most new projects not have natural gas connected. They're going to go all electric and they're in general going to have some sort of microgrid or at least on a house by house basis, solar. So where do all the decarbonization uh, gains come from? Well, it's not just energy. It's more uh, efficient industry, it's agriculture, uh, other nature-based solutions, uh, transportation, obviously a huge one, then buildings and smart cities. You notice that the pie slices are all pretty close. So this is a place where we can make a lot of money different ways. So when I invest in decarbonization, I'm thinking, you know, Ford, I'm thinking Nutrien and uh, certain materials companies. I'm thinking different types of builders. I'm thinking EVs and the future of green hydrogen on heavy transportation. There's a lot of ways to play this. Interestingly, in this century, even though we've used more electronic devices, we've become less energy intensive, and that's going to continue. Now, absolute energy use will probably go up at the electricity level, but we'll end up using less uh, energy through other sources, primarily fossil fuels. OPEC controlled the price of oil by slashing production during COVID and not getting back up to where they were. Pretty straightforward analysis. Inflation is half energy. So as energy goes, inflation pretty much goes. That's always been the case. Now, where is the future of oil? In the short term, probably higher if OPEC makes it higher. But in the longer term, three, four, five years out, we probably actually get a lower price range on oil because the companies and the countries that have oil are going to be forced to pump it so that it isn't stranded in the ground. If you go to the London School of Economics and look up uh, Jeremy Grantham's uh, foundation and, and research, what you see is that sometime later this decade, again, 2025, six, seven, it keeps coming up those three, four, five years, you know, towards the middle and end of the decade is when oil demand really flattens uh, to the point where it's starting to maybe head down by 2030 and you're going to have panic pumping. People are going to try to get their oil out of the ground so it's not stranded there. Certain countries will pump the oil for export. And when the export mo uh, markets dry up a little bit, they will use the oil themselves. And then eventually that goes away too uh, because alternative energy and clean energy is becoming cheaper every year while fossil fuel energy gets more expensive every year. Pretty easy to understand if fossil fuels are getting more expensive and clean energy is getting cheaper, there's a crossing point. We're basically at it right now when you include the tax breaks. And even without the tax breaks in three to five years, uh, clean energy would have been cheaper. That's why you see coal power plants getting torn down in the United States and replaced with solar and battery systems. So what was Europe's re response to energy, uh, the energy shock? you know, the, the Russian-Ukrainian uh, problem. Uh, in the short term, they've used more fossil fuels because they've had to, in particular coal, uh, because Russia cut off natural gas or has threatened to cut off natural gas. Norway just stepped in and is increasing natural gas production. And you have companies that we're invested in, like New Fortress Energy, do liquefied natural gas at sea, at the well, you know, doing, doing really well. The long run response by Europe is to go almost entirely clean energy. So we see what's coming, who's sending them uh, uh, natural gas. Norway is going to keep on taking market share from Russia and they won't threaten to pull it away. So the EU has vowed to cut planet heating emissions by 55% uh, and get the net zero in the next few decades. The projects that are coming online, the way that the governments are spreading the money around 
who they're bailing out, who they're not bailing out is, is easy to follow. Europe probably be 80% clean energy way faster than people think uh, before 2040. Japan following the same path. They'll use a few more nuclear power plants, I think, but I'm not sure. Uh, China is doing everything they can to ramp up solar and wind, but particularly solar, they're the leader in the world. India is pushing green hydrogen and solar. So you start to see these recurring themes by gigantic economies with very proactive governments, and, and it becomes a pretty clear message. This is what's coming. In the United States, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, or as I uh, uh, call it, the, you know, the, the, the mini balanced Build Back Better, uh, was really three things. It was clean energy, it was limiting the price on pharmaceuticals, and kind of implementing a minimum corporate tax. So in line with what I told you about that development I was looking at, appliances are going to go all electric, and that's going to be tied into microgrids and you know a more alternative energy, clean energy-led general utility grid. That's where the tax breaks are. Again, like I said, if you're building, building a new development that's not already, already hooked up to gas. Now, buildings that are already hooked up to gas uh, probably keep it, but subdivisions and buildings that are not hooked up to gas, they're not going to get hooked up to gas. Already happening in California, we're talking about it in Wisconsin. Heat pumps, rooftop solar, HVAC systems, water heaters, all getting tax credits if they're more efficient. And then EVs, right, are already there. So three ETFs that I'm using for climate change, the First Trust NASDAQ QClean, which is important to notice is more of a large cap fund. And it has outperformed on the back of Enphase and Tesla. Invesco, Wilder Hill Clean Energy, PBW, small cap for the most part, so mid, small, and micro. A bunch of companies that are hard to invest in individually because it's hard to keep up with a lot of small companies. Uh, but look at that. Enovix jumps to the top of the list today. So we need to be very aware of this company because we've been talking about it for months. We have a couple of uh, subscribers, one in particular, who's really alerted us to this. And it's something that we should take a look at. Wolf Speed, you know, some of these other ones are pretty interesting companies. I actually have a screen about Plug Power uh, later on today. So I love this fund uh, for a number of reasons that I'll go over in the next minute or so. TAN really is for uh, folks who want to trade or just be committed to solar for the long term. Uh, the thing to remember is that it's about 20% China. Um, I'm not a big China fan because I don't trust them. Uh, if I am going to get my exposure, uh, it's going to be through baskets in industries that I think will do well that the government will leave alone. Uh, it looks like uh, the government of China is really going to back clean energy. They're already doing it. I think that's going to continue billions and billions of dollars. So we want to have a piece of China. Well, then we probably want this piece uh, along with the online businesses, which we get through another ETF that we use. So TAN market cap, more mid cap. Again, Enphase, but First Solar, Solar Edge, Sun Run, a lot of these companies are companies that we talk about. So of the five most popular clean energy, iClean, QClean, PBW, Aces, and TAN, when you take a look at their industry spread, uh, I really like technology and industrials. So PBW, here you go, about 60% technology and industrials, uh, QClean about 50%, and TAN about 75%. Here's the thing. A lot of what's considered technology now will eventually be considered energy in the future. That's, that's just, in my opinion, miscategorized like solar cells and things. Uh, they'll really be counted as energy in the future. I do like the consumer cyclical aspect of PBW and QClean. That's mainly the EVs. So QClean's heavy in PBW, uh, and, and excuse me, QClean is heavy in Tesla. PBW is heavy in some of the smaller EV companies. So if one of them catches fire, you know, there's your big winner. Uh, the way that this fund is managed, it uses a quantitative formula. So losers get booted and it's also relatively equal weight. So a fast winner, a big winner is more important than some of the losers uh, because they dump the losers and they ride the big winners. How have clean energy ETFs performed since the 2018 bottom? Pretty clear. Kick the crap out of QQQ, which kicked the crap out of SPY. This is the future. This is where government money and institutional money is going. Uh, this is even where the real estate investors are putting money. Uh, take a look at Brookfield Asset Management uh, and some of the firms that I just talked to in town in the last month about the deal that I don't think will get done that I want to do. 
um, because I, he's a million dollars overpriced, and that's a hard gap to make up. Here's Tan, QClean, PBW. And I believe PBW will close the gap on QClean and maybe do better in the next five years. So I think these small companies are really set up well. And I'm not so sure that Tesla is going to be much of a market leader. I, I rate Tesla a market perform. You can trade it, but I think the big money's been made in that. You should be looking for smaller companies, companies like Ford. Uh, that will be producing as many EVs as Tesla in the next couple of years, and yet are valued at one twelfth. You know why is Tesla twelve times more valuable than Ford? That doesn't make any sense at all. So the Tesla factor, just talking about that with QClean, I still like to have some allocation there. I'm going to focus on PBW because I really like the small caps. I think the way the tax code is going, uh, the way that antitrust rules are are happening all over the, all over the world. Uh, I think the small caps and the mid caps are in great shape. Plus, the oil majors with all this free cash flow and becoming uh, low debt and other companies becoming no debt in the next two, three, four years on the oil and gas side, they're going to go and buy some of those small companies and then, and then get into clean energy. So these are a great place to invest. We've talked about Ford and Sun Power before. That's the rest of that. So I should be on the side of the screen now. I actually um, talked about Coles the other day because they have solar panels on the roof. And this company is a company that I keep an eye on, TJ Maxx. I don't think we buy that until it gets really cheap. But if there's a lot of inventory reductions after Christmas, uh, and if there's a correction between now and then, if we can get TJ Maxx in the 40s somewhere, probably be pretty interesting to me. Uh, but again, it was KSS that I was looking at, do all sorts of things. Um, I think that Kohl's is close to being a buy as kind of a backdoor play on clean energy and on real estate development. I think that they're going to make some of the right decisions on real estate. Uh, two of my conversations, I brought Kohl's up specifically because I didn't know who knows who. I think that Kohl's probably starts developing a lot of their locations and putting mixed use and residential uh, right on top of their coal stores or right next to their coal stores and building kind of mini walkable areas uh, for, you know, seven, 800 people, maybe a thousand people to live on site. Uh, some of their locations are bigger. So if you take a look at the footprint of coals on a map, uh, you see some of those parking lots are just gigantic. There's a lot they can do with that land and they will. They've been very smart over 20 or 30 years about the real estate that they bought. Uh, and again, backdoor play on microgrids and clean energy and more efficient use of space. Here's a little blurb about Norway taking Russia's market share. Some of our other stocks, Metis, tons of tax breaks. If you've taken a look at the last uh, uh, earnings report and the most recent quarterly call, it just leaves your head, it just leaves you scratching your head why this stock isn't $30 right now. So, I mean, it's just screaming for you to buy it. New Fortress Energy, uh, it broke out right where I said it would break out. I don't know if we ever get it cheap, cheap again. I would expect on a general correction, we can get it near 40 again. And if there's a recession, it could go much lower. So you just have to understand how cycles work with energy. Uh, but this technology that they have of doing liquefied natural gas at the wellhead in the ocean is unbelievably valuable. And then they're also a backdoor play on green, uh, green hydrogen. Other company that's really kind of caught my eye lately is uh, Plug Power, but there's a few other plays like this. Uh, but Plug Power talks about green hydrogen. They're going to be a player in this and their battery cells are going to get used a lot. And the fact that they're going to use electrolyzers and, and manufacture these, which are going to be huge in green hydrogen, at least in the short run, probably a huge boost to their business. So if we can get Plug on the cheap, uh, we will probably do that. And I will be adding this to the VSL again. It used to be there. I don't know exactly where the bottom is. I mean, I don't think it ever goes into single digits again. And I'm having a hard time figuring out exactly where the big support here is. But I'm guessing around 20. It really looks like around 20. So if you put in a line from there, you can see it starts to get pretty good support there. And it was resistance, went through came down and broke through that resistance. Now it broke back above it, you know, broke, you know, became support, broke through it, tested it, broke through it, but didn't go too far. So I don't really know that that's a huge violation, especially given where the other line would be. 
So the other line could be about here. And I'll see where the big accumulations and distributions come. So I think it just got into a range, which was natural. Now it, it wants to go higher. But I think, man, we get a price in the low 20s. That's probably the right price for plug. I will work up a, a better chart, but just eyeballing it, that's about what it looks like. So I'd be curious and I'll ask Shooter what he thinks. So that's really where I am today. If we get a, part, a pullback here because the Fed is tightening up uh, in September with the roll-offs of the balance sheet, and if they do go three quarters of a point and they don't signal that they're close to being done, this end of the year could be the double bottom that I talked about or a triple bottom. I'm not sure if we break through the S&P 500 bottom or just retest it. Uh, either way, uh, on the retest, we have to be buying. And then whether it goes up or goes down further, we have to be buying. Uh, because the next couple of years going into the presidential cycle with the money that people are going to have from the student don't, uh, loan debt relief, from the money that people are going to have from being you know, in full employment, uh, unless the Fed causes a recession or something internationally causes a recession, man, there's just going to be a lot of money flowing in the stocks and you want to be on the right side of the uh, hot secular trends. And that's where we're going to be. So keep an eye on these ETFs. Uh, I really like PBW. QClean, I think you deserve deserves a little allocation. Uh, as you know, I do things differently than others. I favor the small and mid caps over the large caps. And, and I think that even if you're a retiree, you should have about the same amount of small and mid as you do large. So if you're Large asset allocation is 40% of your equities, then small plus mid caps combined should be 40%. And I think that that's probably maybe the best advice I can give you on asset allocation. Have your SMID equal your large, and uh, you'll probably do very, very well and live a long, profitable life. All right, I will uh, let you all go. I'm going to get this uh, process and hopefully up before folks jump on at four o'clock because they missed the... Uh, the change in start time. All right, everybody have a great day.